Um, We've got a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now, the last time I preached a psalm, it was Psalm 11, and uh, we talked about uh, David fleeing from Saul. If anybody remembers that, it was like a year ago, so you probably don't. Um, but we talked about that week. Fleeing's not really something that we're super familiar with in 21st century Cobb County. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has fled for their lives in the last ever um, because we live pretty nice lives here. Um, but, it, but it's something that's good for us to understand the context of when we read this psalm. So today, we're going to be going through the story of Absalom's betrayal of his father, David, which begins in 2 Samuel chapter 13. I really think this psalm comes to life in a, in a, uh, a special way when you understand what's going on behind it. Uh, and if I was to name this sermon, I might call it The Sins of the Fathers, because uh, it's a story of David's sons. It's a story of their sexual depravity and murder and betrayal. And it follows David's own story of sexual depravity and murder and betrayal. Uh, and it's the story of the sins of a father and the failure and humiliation of a king. So 2 Samuel 11 tells a story I think most of us are probably familiar with, the story of David's affair with Bathsheba, uh, the scandalous pregnancy that followed the affair and his eventual uh, murder, David's eventual murder of her husband Uriah when uh, he couldn't find another way out of the mess. Then the next chapter, 2 Samuel 12, is the confrontation of David by Nathan, the prophet, who uh, gets a parable from the Lord, and he brings it uh, to David and tells it to him to help David see the, the evil of his sin and what David has done, and it, it convicts David. And the Lord spoke through Nathan and told David that his house would be plagued with evil from his own family from that day forward. And it all kicks off with the son of David and Bathsheba being struck sick by the Lord and and eventually dying, and it's just awful, and it's sad, which brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 13, uh, which is the story of his other sons. Uh, now, while you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 13, because we're going to read through it, uh, I want you guys to know, David had at least 20 children. We know some were legitimate through his many wives, some were illegitimate, children of concubines. Uh, he was a promiscuous man. He had Eight wives in scripture, but he also had some who we know were unnamed. Um, and from these relationships, we know he had at least 19 sons and one daughter. Uh, we don't know how many children he had from his concubines. Um, but we do know that David was not a good father. He was an indulgent father. Um, and it seems he denied his children absolutely nothing. Uh, so our background for Psalm 3 today begins with his firstborn son. If you're a note taker, the names are weird, so it may help if you're not familiar with the story to write them down. Uh, we've got uh, really three major characters here that we're opening with. Uh, it begins with David's firstborn son, whose name is Amnon, then his thirdborn son, whose name was Absalom, and then his daughter, Tamar. So if you want to open with me, 2 Samuel chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. Amnon was David's firstborn son again, and so he was the heir to the throne. He was the crown prince of Jerusalem, and he was attracted to his half-sister, Tamar. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother. So this is Amnon's cousin. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. The word there is, the, the word is wise, but it's got a negative connotation. So we say crafty. And Jonadab said to Amnon, oh, son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? So Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So Jonadab says to him, well, the king say to him, let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon laid down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, please let my sister Tamar, Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. So David sent home to Tamar saying, go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, send out everyone from me. So everyone went out from him. Everyone emptied the house. 
And Amnon said to Tamar when they were alone, bring the food into the chamber that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come, lie with me, my sister. Is never satisfied. Uh, And we see Amnon shows no attempts to fight his urges. He even schemed to achieve them, right? He's not a victim of momentary temptation here. This is premeditated. All of David's sons, it, it seems, all inherit his sexual immorality, especially Solomon, who we all know. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So Tamar answered him. She said, no, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Don't do this outrageous thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her. And being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And this is what one moment, what looks so appealing and so appetizing, instantly becomes disgusting as the truth behind what was done is revealed and it's no longer obscured by the sinful passion. I think C.S. Lewis Lewis puts it really well in his book, The Four Loves. He says this of lust. You know, we use the most unfortunate idiom when we say of a lustful man prowling the streets that he wants a woman. Strictly speaking, a woman, is just what he, a woman is just what he does not want. He wants pleasure for which a woman happens to be the necessary piece of apparatus. How much he cares about the woman as such may be gauged by his attitude to her five minutes after fruition. One does not keep the carton after one has smoked the cigarettes. And Amnon said to her, get up and go. But she said to him, no, my brother, for this is wrong in sending me away. For the wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. She says, brother, it's worse that you rape me and then send me away. The law in Israel is uh, rapists were required to marry the woman they raped, which seems odd to us. But the truth is, when a woman was raped, she was defiled. Nobody would want to marry her. So the law was requiring the man to take her under his wing and to take care of her because she would not be able to find a husband. So she says, this is worse to send me away after. But he called the young man who served him and said, put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. And the Hebrew doesn't actually have the word woman. He really just says, put this out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Because Tamar was nothing more to her brother than a reminder of his depravity now. He wouldn't even use her name. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So a servant put her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. And her brother Absalom, her full brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. And when King David heard of these things, he was very angry. And what does the next verse say? But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. And the next verse skips two full years which means David was mad, and that was it. David did nothing about what happened between his children. David, who had the courage to stand up before a giant when nobody else would, he's a shadow of the man that he once was, and his passivity ruins his family. Verse 23 says, after two full years... Absalom had sheep shears at Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. So he was having a big feast. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, your servant has sheep shears. Please let the king and his servants go with your servants. So Absalom goes to his father David and he says, Look, I'm having a big feast. I want you to come. He knew his dad wouldn't want to come. And he says, And I want all of your sons to come. But we know he's been scheming over the last two years. And this has nothing to do with the feast. He wants revenge on his brother. But David said to Absalom, no, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome to you. But Absalom pressed him 
But David would not go, but David did give his blessing. And then Absalom said, okay, if not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And David said to him, why should he go with you? But again, Absalom pressed David until he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Just like David sent his daughter to her rape, he sends his son to his murder now. And Absalom commanded his servants, mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not fear. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. Absalom almost makes this cowardly murder seem noble. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. And then all the king's son arose after seeing their brother murdered, and they all mounted their mules and fled. We see just as David slept with a woman who wasn't his wife, who belonged to another man, and then got Uriah drunk, and then had others do his dirty work of murder, Amnon committed rape and incest. He was made drunk by his brother, and then Absalom got others to do his dirty work of murder. And when the word came to David, he was devastated. I want to skip down to verse 37. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, king of Geshur. This was Absalom's grandfather on his mom's side. And David mourned for his son Amnon day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. And there's some debate as to what exactly this means. But most likely it means David had to some extent forgiven his son um, and, uh, but, but he was not going to call him home. And I'm going to summarize the rest of the story. Uh, I don't want to read it. Um, but I wanted you guys to see as we, as we begin, uh, 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 through chapter 13, it, it goes all the way to chapter 18. Uh, and I recommend read it yourself. Uh, read it this week. Um, cause I'm going to have to leave some stuff out as we continue through this to get to the psalm, but it is a heartbreaking, it's a devastating story, and one important, I think, that we all, one that's very important that we all familiarize ourselves with. So Absalom is with his grandfather in Geshur for three years, and eventually Joab, who was one of David's nephews, he was the commander of David's armies. Joab's a very important character, remember him, we'll talk about him more. He convinces David, he says, David, you gotta send for your son to come home. I can tell that this is tearing you up. You gotta bring Absalom back to Jerusalem. So David does, David sends for Absalom because he misses his son and he has to some extent forgiven him. However, David refuses to see or speak to Absalom upon Absalom's return. So even though Absalom is back in Jerusalem, he can't see his father. And Absalom stays in Jerusalem and is ignored by his father for another two years. And over that time, Absalom becomes furious with his father that his father won't see him or even acknowledge him. So Absalom finally goes to Job. He's like, why am I here? Why did my father invite me back into the city if he's not even gonna speak to me? I would rather that he invited me into his court and put me to death for my sins. That would be better than this just ignoring. So Joab goes to David and talks to him. He's like, David, you've got to reconcile with your son. You've gotta bring justice for all the sin. So David calls his son and finally summons him. It's been five years since David has seen Absalom. And when they meet David doesn't say anything about the past. He doesn't say anything about what's been done. He gives his son a kiss, and that's it. So Absalom, still angry at his passive father, begins to hatch a plan. And after this day, he began to sit at the city gate every single day. He did that for the next four years after leaving his father, he would sit at the city gate where everybody that was coming to see David would have to walk through the city gate and he would intercept them before they got in. And he would talk to them. And something important that 2 Samuel tells us about Absalom that signs some light on what's coming in the future is that like his sister Tamar, he was a very good looking man. And it seems he was especially known amongst the Jews for his thick head of hair. And he was a smart guy and he took advantage of his good looks to win over the hearts of the people of Israel. So he would intercept anybody that was coming in to, to meet with his father for any kind of decision making. And he would sweet talk the people and he would discourage them from approaching his father. He'd say, he'd be like, oh yeah, your claims are good. They're right, but that's too bad. There's just no man designated by the king to hear you. Oh, if only I were the judge in Israel there. 
And he would send people away. And 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 6 says, after Absalom had done this for four years, so he stole the hearts of all the men of Israel. So Absalom, having stolen Israel from his father in just four years without David even knowing, decides it's time for his great rebellion. So he tells his father, he says, Dad, I really want to go to the old holy city. I want to go to Hebron, which is the, the old city before David was anointed, or where David was anointed as king. And he says, I want to go to Hebron. I want to worship. That's about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. And David says, you may go. So he gets his entourage, and Absalom heads out of the city. And soon after he leaves, a messenger comes to David and tells him, David, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. So David, suddenly seeing the treachery of his son, ups and flees Jerusalem. Right, this is all that he needed to hear to know that his son was plotting to kill him. And on his way out, uh, he, as he and those who are still loyal to him, a very small group comparatively, uh, he decides, I'm going to leave 10 of my concubines back to take care of the palace uh, the rest of my family and my people were going to leave the city. And he just flees with this ragtag group, mostly Gentiles, uh, some Philistines even. And that's where David feels this. So you can flip now to Psalm chapter 3, verse 1. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me, and many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. It shines a new light on it when you understand that the entire kingdom of Israel has been turned against David. They didn't even turn against God, just David. Almost all the men, remember, that actually followed David out of Jerusalem were Gentiles, but David's own people turned against him, and not just for a new ruler, right? They believed that God himself had turned his back on David, just like Saul. I mean, after all, David's sins sure seem to be worse than Saul's sins, right? So the people are like, here we have another king who has failed us and God has turned his back on him. I think David was in a lower place than any of us could ever comprehend. I don't think we have the capability of, of messing up this bad. Uh, though we've all, of course, made messes of our lives, David made a mess of the lives of millions of people. To have millions of people doubting your salvation, the same people that once sang your praises. Devastating. Verse three, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Now we think of shields, we just think of ancient you know, weapon, but that, this was a very modern thing for David, and David was very familiar with shields. Uh, he was once Saul's armor bearer. He knew the importance of good armor, and he, and he knew that a shield was armor on top of armor. It was a great thing to have, but David, we don't see him often using a shield. Uh, he didn't have a shield with him when he was a shepherd, and he fought lions and bears as a young man. He didn't have a shield with him when he fought Goliath. David knew better than anybody that having God on his side was better than any shield he could wield. No matter what weapon the enemy brought against him, David knew they couldn't land a blow on him without God allowing it. And here's what's crazy. David was prepared for God to allow it. Look at verse four. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Now, we know exactly what David is talking about here if we look at 2 Samuel. So go to excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 15, because we see here that not only did David cry out to the Lord, but he truly trusted God's answer, whether God was uh, answering was David's victory or David's death. He says in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 25, some of the men had brought the ark out of the city uh, to go with them. They were like, hey man, this will bring us good luck, right? But David knew God. He's like, no, put the ark back, okay? That's not gonna help us at all. Carry the ark of God back into the city, if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. And God's answer would come from the very place that David was fleeing. When he says God has spoken from his holy hill, he's talking about the holy hill of Jerusalem where the temple would one day be built and God's answer was going to come in the form of a great army marching out to decide the final results of this sinful rebellion. And somehow, 
Even though David knew that God's answer to his prayer would be an army for good or for bad for David. Look what David says next. Verse 5. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. He's talking literally, I'm able to sleep even though there are thousands coming after me. Only with massive faith could anybody sleep after your whole kingdom has just betrayed you. Left and right, he's had people, he's had some of his closest counselors betray him. He doesn't even know if everybody that's with him now is on his side. But still he's able to sleep. Arise, O Lord, verse 7. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek and you break the teeth of the wicked, which is awesome. God is not soft on sin like David. The Lord has zero tolerance for evil and he always brings justice. And God does even more than breaking the teeth of the wicked. Let's get back to our story and see how it resolves before we move to the last verse of this chapter. As David is fleeing the city, David finds out that one of his closest counselors, one of his best generals, has betrayed him. But another of David's allies goes back into the city as a spy and as an informant. So uh, while David is fleeing out over the Mount of Olives out of the eastern side of Jerusalem, Absalom is just arriving back, and David's inside man goes into the city to tell Absalom, hey, I'm on your side. I, too, like everyone else, am betraying your father. And again, here we see Absalom paralleling the sins of his father. Remember, David left 10 of his concubines there to care for his great house. And Absalom is looking to further humiliate his father and show Israel that he has completely burned the bridge and taken not just the city, but his own father's legacy. So Absalom and his council decide to set up a tent on the roof of his father's house, the very roof from where David spied Bathsheba, and set all of this into motion. At the very roof where David's sexual depravity brought him to ruin. Here his son takes it even further. 2 Samuel chapter 16 verse 22 says, so they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Which, by the way, was a prophecy fulfilled from 2 Samuel 12, verse 11, which, where Nathan said, speaking on behalf of God, thus says the Lord to David, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And it works. This disgusting display of public profanity convinces the people. It cements the feelings of Israel for Absalom. And they're like, yes, you are our guy. And they plan for their attack. So Absalom and his generals gather together and they begin to plan. And God makes a way for David's inside man to get in on that meeting. And a great plan is set forth by Absalom's men, but David's inside guy comes in and says, no, 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 they say we've got to move immediately against David. But David's inside guy knows David's exhausted, his soldiers are exhausted, and they're weary, so he goes in and says, against your father? He and his men, angry bears whom you've just taken their cubs? No, they are raving right now. Give them time. Let's amass a giant army to go against them. And Absalom listens to him. Because God puts it in his head. So they use his obviously intentionally ineffective plan to give David time to prepare himself and his men for battle. So a little time goes by and as David and his generals are planning for this uh, final battle, his generals say, David, you've got to stay back. You can't go to this fight with us. And David resists, but they say, listen, David, you are worth 10,000 of us, so what if half of us die? We can flee. They might not even chase us, but if you're there, everyone dies. So David decides, okay, I won't go to battle, but he does give them one single order. He says, Joab, you can run it however you want to run it, but be gentle with Absalom. Please don't kill him. And you... In case you're thinking this is depressing, but at least it's a family affair, it's not. 
In this battle, 20,000 Israelites died at the hands of David's servants in the woods of Ephraim. 20,000 people died, 20,000 families torn apart because of David and his son's sins. You may say, well, what happened in the battle? We don't know. It gets like three verses in 2 Samuel. Apparently, it was a horrible defeat. It actually says that the trees killed more people than the men did. I don't know what that means, but uh, the battle was a massive failure on Absalom's part. And after the army had been defeated, Absalom came face to face with some of David's servants on the battlefield in the forest. And since the battle was over and uh, Absalom was overcome and he was all alone, he fled. And as he fled, David's men pursued And he was on his mule and he was flying through these densely packed forests. And as he was riding, his hair got tangled in a tree in the branches of one of the oak trees, this beautiful hair that he was so proud of. And as his mule rode away, he got tangled and was yanked off the back of his mule and left suspended in the air above the ground by his hair. So the men caught up to him and he was just hanging there and he couldn't get down. So they go and they get Joab. They say, Joab, Come back, help us, what are we supposed to do? And for years, Joab has been the middleman in this dysfunctional relationship between this son and his father. And he's like, I'm not mediating any more. So Joab disobeys David's order to spare his son. Joab takes three spears and he throws all three of them into Absalom. And he must have intentionally missed his vital organs because Absalom survived. So as Absalom is still there hanging from this tree with three spears in him, 10 men, one for each of David's concubines, descend on Absalom and beat him to death. And the battle's won, and the men celebrate. And one of David's men comes running to give him the good news of their victory. Just look at the tone of 2 Samuel 18. We're gonna, we're gonna read verse 31. He comes and said, good news for my lord, the king. For the Lord has delivered you this day from the hand of all who rose up against you. All of Israel knew what had happened to David's family. Look, David, you must be so excited. But David only cares about one thing. The king said to the Cushite, but is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my Lord the king and All who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved. And it's hard to capture the weight with just the English translation, but the Hebrew here for deeply moves uh, can also be translated as violently shaking. And he goes shambling and shaking up to the chamber over the gate, and he wept. And if you're anything like me and you're familiar with David's story, if any of you have known the story of David before, uh, this is the man after God's own heart. And he starts off so promising. And you can see in the early days, yeah, I can see he's a poet, he's a warrior. What an amazing guy is King David. He's the man for the job, it seems, always. But when you see his life begin to fall apart, you go, how is this the man after God's own heart? And I think the answer we see right here, David, as he's weeping, he went and he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. But David couldn't die for Absalom. He couldn't die for his son because Absalom's life wasn't David's to give. Even if David could have died in Absalom's place, David's just a guy, right? What can David do? His death would have accomplished nothing but getting Absalom a few more sinful years on this earth. He had no righteousness to give for Absalom's depravity. Which brings us to our final verse in Psalm chapter three, verse eight. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing beyond your people. Knowing the context of this psalm, this is a much more bittersweet line than it first appears. The blessing for God's people, what was it? It was the death of 20,000 men to turn them back from their rebellion to the king that God chose. And as for salvation being from the Lord, David learned the hard way that salvation does belong to the Lord. 
And he learned that no matter how mighty his feats and how loyal his men, God saves who he saves. And like I think it was Spurgeon that said, the best of men are men at best. Salvation belongs to the Lord because only the Lord could afford it. Absalom's rebellion, look, rebellion, it should disgust us. And all the sins of David and his son should make us sick. And I could flip this and talk about fatherhood and the importance of being proactive and family. Or we could go to Genesis and parallel this and did with David and Lot, right? How a man can get to heaven without his family. It's true. And I encourage you to read it from that lens on your own because it's scary to think that a man after God's own heart could have such wretched children. And it should be a call to us, especially the fathers in the room. But I leave that to you to read on your own. I just want us to see one thing. We are Absalom in this story. Really, we're worse than Absalom in this story. You say, how could that possibly be true? Because he rebelled against a sinful king and a sinful father. But we have rebelled against our heavenly father. We tried to steal his kingdom. We broke his laws and we have humiliated him. I mean, the father we sinned against was perfect should convict us and all of that sickness and all of the stuff that this story does to your gut why is this necessary to talk about one because it happened but two because it brings us into the mirror of our own sin against a perfect God and I hope that I help to see some of the parallels between David and his sons for you guys I hope you guys can see how David's sins led to his sons not just sitting like their father but taking them even further But I want to make one more parallel between David and another man who wasn't his literal son, but who went by son of David. Before we do that, I want to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 15, starting in verse 23. We already read this. I just want to rehash it for you guys. All the land wept aloud as all the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with all the Levites, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the Ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, if God says to me, David says, if God says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. David, as he crossed the brook Kidron to pay the price for his sins before God, he was willing. He was willing to pay the price for all of his sins. He understood what he deserved. But God gave David mercy. A thousand years later, another man would cross the same brook, willing to pay not only for David's sins, but for the sins of all of his people And I wonder if Jesus thought of David when he and his disciples crossed the brook into the Garden of Gethsemane, the same route that David took escaping onto the Mount of Olives. John chapter 18 verse 1 says, when Jesus had spoken these words after his high priestly prayer, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas who betrayed him also knew this place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. This was a place that Jesus and his disciples went a lot of the time, and that's why he went there. But Judas didn't go there because he knew for sure that Jesus would be there. Jesus went there because he knew for sure that was the first place Judas would look. It seems like Judas is in control, but Jesus knew exactly where Judas was going. He didn't catch Jesus in the garden. Adam hid in the garden. Jesus went to the garden to be found. And Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So we know it's at night. And Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Who do you seek? And they answered him, We seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to him, I am he. Ego on me. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. And when Jesus said to them, I am he. Right, the great, the final great I am statement of Jesus and John, they drew back and the power of the Son of God saying his name, they fell to the ground. So Jesus asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I have lost not one. 
But then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, which, by the way, I always thought it was weird that Peter cut off a guy's ear. Like, why would you aim for his ear? Well, he didn't succeed at cutting off his ear. He failed at cutting off his head, in case you guys didn't catch that. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Jesus was willing to take on way more than David was. And like our world fell apart in a garden, it was put back together here when Jesus agreed to take the cup that was full of God's wrath, the divine judgment, and Jesus took it to his lips and he drained every last drop of God's wrath for his people on the cross. And Jesus was born to die. He wasn't surprised by the turn of events. He was sovereign over everything that was happening here. And unlike David, Jesus could die to save sinners. And he did. And we read the story of David and we get so amazed. How could David lose his way? But it shouldn't amaze us. In a way, David also was just repeating the sins of his first father, Adam. Right? I, I think it's worth commending David for his willingness to die for a sinful son because Adam failed that test in the garden. We know in the Garden of Eden when man fell, when, when Eve ate from that fruit, Adam was not willing to die for his bride. The way the Bible tells us a good husband is willing to die. And when Eve sinned in the garden, Adam sold his wife out. I mean, the way that the garden should have gone is when Eve ate the fruit. I always think Adam should have been like, no, Eve, I'm not eating that fruit. In fact, you're disgusting to me. And I hope that the next woman that God makes me isn't so persuadable as you. But that's not what Adam was supposed to do. We know what Adam was supposed to do because we know what the better Adam did, right? What Adam should have done is he should have taken his wife and gone and stood before God. And he should have approached God himself and faced God's righteous and just fury at the sins of Eve. And he should have looked at God and said, take me instead. Adam was going to die either way, but instead of dying as a savior, he died a sinner because he did take the fruit. And he did eat it. And our first father, Adam, blamed Eve and then blamed God himself for his sin. And because he ate the fruit, because of this one man, sin came into the world and death came into the world through sin. And every single person born from the line of this man inherited his sinful nature. Right? We read the story, we want justice. We say, how could they do this? But the truth is, David inherited it. He got it honest as a sinner. Amnon inherited it. Tamar inherited it. Absalom inherited it. Joab inherited it. We inherited it. The sinful nature of our father, Adam, and all of us stand equally guilty before a holy and righteous and just God. And we say we want justice all through history. People have read the story of Absalom and said, we demand justice. How is this justice? But the problem with justice is we love it, but if it came before Jesus, everyone dies. And everyone gets God's wrath. So what do we do? Where do we go? Because every man that was born of an earthly father and conceived in iniquity, we're all sinners. And the truth is, nobody has ever been that much better than their father before him or his father before him. All of us have been guilty of sin before God and things look hopeless. If all you do is read the story of David and his sons, things look hopeless. And the story of David doesn't really get better. He falls just like Saul because he was a human king and he was not the king that Israel needed. And over and over and over again through the whole Old Testament, we just see over time and time again, men sinning, men falling short. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, who was born of woman, born under the law. Right? Jesus came into the world not born of Adam's line, not conceived in sin like the rest of mankind, but he wasn't a child of the flesh. He was born of a virgin, and because he's born of a virgin, he's not born and conceived in iniquity. He was born of the Spirit, and he, stayed, he was born clean. 
For the first time ever, God sent a young child born clean and he stayed clean and he obeyed God's law perfectly. And because Jesus is truly God and truly man, he obeys God's law on our behalf. It's the only reason he can is because he is truly a man and truly our God. And he lived a perfect life that none of us could. We just talked to our students about what exactly that means. And we highlighted one specific example I want to share with you. It means he never ceased to obey the commandments of God, even the most important commandment, which is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Jesus loved God with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his mind all the time. I mean, think of the most righteous Christian you've ever known. Think of the person that shared the gospel with you. Think of, think of one Christian that you look up to more than anybody else and think that they have never once in their life, even for a second, loved the Lord their God with all of their heart, soul, mind. But Jesus did it all the time, even in his innermost thoughts. Even on an earth full of Absaloms and Davids and Amnons and Joabs and Scotties, still Jesus never ceased to love God the way that God deserves to be loved. Even in the darkness of the world, and it broke Jesus' heart. Jesus knew nothing of sin the same way we know nothing of righteousness. There's no action in our lives that isn't tainted in some way by sin. Isaiah said that even the most righteous and devoted act ever committed out of mankind is still filthy rags before God because of our sin. But everything that Jesus ever did came perfectly from the love of God and it was all spotless. I mean, try to imagine that kind of sinlessness and then imagine that kind of sinlessness being made to be sin. Because Jesus was made sin, him who knew no sin. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, and we've all done what seems right in our own eyes. But God laid all of our sin on Jesus on the cross. And I want to close with Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who was hanged on a tree. Like Absalom, Jesus hung from a tree. Like Absalom, he was pierced with spears. Absalom got what he deserved, and Jesus got what we deserve. And he suffered God's fury and the wrath of an eternal hell poured onto himself. And I just want everyone in the room to know God's wrath was completely spent on Jesus. No matter what kind of father you have, no matter what kind of father you are, no matter what kind of children you raise, you can know that there is no wrath from God left for you. If your faith is in Jesus, there's none left in the cup. He drank it all, and he died and after three days, he rose again, and he conquered sin, and he conquered death, and he conquered hell, and he conquered the grave. In the same way that our sin was imputed to Jesus, the same way it stuck to him, even though he knew no sin, even though he, he had no sin, every sinful thought of us, every evil action of ours, every act of rebellion against a holy God that all believers in him have ever committed, it all smothered Jesus on a cross. And on the other end, Jesus' righteousness was imputed to us, which means though, even though we sin, we're still perfect and without sin in God's eyes. Right? The way that our sin sticks to Jesus, his righteousness sticks to us, and our sin has no hold on us anymore. Even though we're not righteous, we are treated as if we are because Jesus traded the reward for his perfect life, for the punishment, for our massive failure against a perfect God. And the, one of the most beautiful things about it to me is that none of us have to be slaves to any sin anymore. It doesn't matter who our fathers were. It doesn't matter what they did. We're not held under the sins of our father anymore, especially the sins of our father, Adam. And though, like David, look, we still have to deal and live with the consequences of our own sins and our lives here on earth. And they can feel heavy at times. We can know, like David, 
that God's grace is so much more than our failures. And we can remember that, verse 8, one more time. Salvation belongs to the Lord. His blessing is on his people. If salvation belonged to us, we'd all be like Absalom. But praise Jesus, nobody has to bear the curse anymore. We just got to repent of our sin and believe on Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, you are a shield about us. Will you just help us to know this the way that that you showed it to David, Lord, that, that we don't have to see our families fall apart, Lord. Because of your son, we don't have to experience these things. We don't have to see everything falling apart to be brought back to you. But we can, can, Lord, we can enjoy the fruit of David's hardship today without having to know the trauma. Lord, if anybody in the room does know the trauma, Lord, I just pray that you will show them that you have so much more grace than their sin has consequences. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen.